ability. So there's a company called Lotusun that has created a paint and fabric uh, technology that directly mimics that. So as raindrops hit the fabric or as raindrop hits the outside of a building, it becomes a self-cleaning material property on the outside of the building. Here's a, you can kind of see the uh, electron microscopy on the right that shows the water bead as it's sitting on the, leaf, the tissue of the leaf and it actually picks up through, uh, I think it's, I can't remember the electrical charge, but it picks up particulates which then stick to the water droplet which then cleans off the leaf structure. Okay, quickly, let's move to our approach to biomimicry. We, what we've seen is kind of the philosophical underpinnings of biomimicry. We've seen case studies of other companies that are doing this. I'll focus now on kind of our approach to, to biomimicry and uh, the way that we're organizing our effort. You can kind of see in the diagram there, we see three distinct aspects uh, to, to a full, what we call a full spectrum approach to biomimicry. There's an emulate part of it, there's an ethos part of it, and then there's a reconnection part of it. And that's what I'll talk about here briefly. So the first part are the, really the hard skills around uh, biomimicry, and that's what we call the conscious emulation of life's genius. What that is, is learning to look very deeply into biological systems and organisms and all the biological knowledge that we can gain through new tools, techniques, processes, and, and, and uh, uh, procedures in, bi in biology, and begin to apply those to design challenges. And that is really the, the, the process by which we approach biomimicry. So we, we take a design challenge, it could be any design challenge, and say, we biologize the question. That's the way we say how would nature solve this? And a lot of times what that forces you to do is to reduce the problem to its essence. So, for example, we, sometimes we have companies that come to us and say, we want, to f we want to have a better, more efficient toothpaste. To biologize the question is to say, how does nature remove particulate from porous materials, for example? We, by using that question, it opens us up to a whole range of biological literature and researchers that we can say, how is nature solving or how has nature solved this in various contexts? We look at that, those, that's, those solutions in nature, and then we begin to extrapolate what we call deep design principles that can be given, to, be given to process engineers, systems engineers, materials designers, whoever else, and say, here's a starting point. Here's seven different ways nature has, has solved uh, removing uh, particulates from a porous surface. How could you take this inspiration and turn it into a toothpaste application, for example? Those are, the, those are the hard skills around biomimicry. Embedded in that is a set of what we call life's principles. And this is a distillation that we've been working on for about 10 years of, the, of what we call nature's operating conditions. This is 3.8 billion years of common denominator of all organisms and systems have adhered to, the ones that have been successful and resilient over time. A really interesting statistic is that 99% of the organisms that have been alive over that 3.8 billion years are now uh, extinct. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing now are, are we're call, what Jenny Binyas calls the A-team. We have, a, we, right now, what's alive is, is things that have fit and flourished over hundreds of thousands of years. We have access to the relics through archaeology and other, other means. But to look at life and, and stable systems right now provides us examples of champion adapters and success stories and sustainability and resilience that are, that are really, uh, really, really valuable. And it turns out that they all share these, these kind of common traits, and that's adhering to these is what's made them successful and resilient over time. Can't go into this, obviously, this is a two-day lecture. <laughs> but what we can say is that at the high level, nature optimizes rather than maximizes, it leverages interdependence, it uses b benign manufacturing, which typically means water-based chemistry. It focuses on resilience. It integrates cyclical processes, and it's locally attuned and responsive. Those high-order principles can go down infinitely to, to a very uh, small scale, which provide the very particular design strategies that we would use on a problem. But this is our main basis by which we approach uh, the conscious emulation of, uh, of life's genius. We've honed this over time through our innovation consultancy in real world design problems. We've worked, uh, one of our biggest clients right now, our partners is HOK Architects. Anybody familiar with them? The large architecture firm. We have a project in India, a really large scale project with them where we're working on ecological landscape planning using biomimicry bio principles. We have a project in China, in Longfong, a restoration project. Uh, we're doing a, really, a lot with HOK in the built environment. But we worked with Kohler Fixtures, the, the materials company. 
We've worked with Nike in seventh generation, GE, Interface Carpets. And it's through that work and through the consultancy that we've begun to hone this, uh, the, the hard skills around the conscious emulation of life's genius. But what we found is that the, the, the conscious emulation and the hard skills have to be coupled with some type of an ethos or a value structure around biomimicry. Um, without the value structure, a lot of, actually a lot of bad things can come out of <laughs> biomimicry. We can actually look to nature and begin extrapolating knowledge that can become weaponized systems, that become, become robotics, and become a lot of crazy things that nature would never really do. So without some type of an ethos or a value structure around what is appropriate biomimicry, what is, what is humans' appropriate place within the, the overall uh, ecosystem, how do we maintain our, ourselves uh, in a humble position as humans, as new, as new kids on the block? That's, around, that's the ethos part of biomimicry. And we approach that through our nonprofit education organization, where we have a university education network. We have a K through 12, kindergarten through 12 program. We have a very large open source uh, website. If you haven't been there yet, you can check out called asknature.org, which is teaching a lot of these ideas and some of the specific um, ideas around this. But we see that the ethos part of biomimicry is really critical to what we call full spectrum biomimicry. We've launched or are launching in March 2011 something called Professional Pathways in Biomimicry, where we're training uh, people all over the world to, to think biomimetically, to, to approach this knowledge and be able to integrate it into their practice, whether you're a designer, a business person, a government official. We're trying to create entry points into biomimicry. Uh, biomimicry for the longest time, um, including Da Vinci and Buckminster Fuller, has been what we call a great man's. Uh, sport. You know, there's been a few individuals that have had the talent, resources, and knowledge to approach biomimicry. We're all about democratizing biomimicry and making as many entry points as possible for those that are interested in this topic, and the professional pathways uh, is one way to do that. Starts uh, as simple as a, an online course, can move to a three-day what we call a backyard workshop in a specific locale, and, and ratchets up all the way to a two-year master's level program in biomimicry. Uh, and lastly, before we're coming to a close, the third part of this is the, and, and equally important is what we call the uh, reconnection part of this. Uh, as we saw in life's principles, life happens in a particular place, and the champion adapters have evolved to, with a very specific knowledge about the place in which they live. A lot of us have become disconnected from our place. In a global society, we really lost touch with the local organismal knowledge and indigenous knowledge that's been there for a very, really long time. And so a huge part of biomimicry is helping people reconnect to place and to find solutions that are relevant to their climate, relevant to their <coughs> region, relevant to their culture. So to do this, we've created a, um, a regional network program. We're piloting in three different areas. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Annette is leading that network in the Netherlands. We have one in South Africa that uh, WESA, the, the Wildlife Society in South Africa, is a partner on. And then one in Northeast Ohio, uh, which the city of Cleveland and a range of universities are in, where we're really starting to say, what does it mean to, to practice biomimicry in place within a network that includes government, nonprofit, uh, commercial, and other interests coming together to reconnect people, place, and economy? Our work has really started to get a lot of attention. I think biomimicry is time has come, so to speak. It's, uh, in one way, it's a common sense idea. In another way, it's, it's a pretty sophisticated <coughs> idea. But it, for whatever reason, it's starting to get some traction. Janine Binyas, who's our thought leader, is, is a tremendous storyteller. And we call her our chief, uh, chief poet officer. <laughs> she really spins by mimicry <coughs> like nobody's business. And because of that, she's really been able to attract some idea to the concepts and has been featured in, in those different publications that you see there. Much to our delight. <coughs> Key to our success are a wide range of partnerships. And this work is so um, broad reaching and also deep that the only way it's going to get done is through a, a variety of strategic partnerships. There are some of them listed there. We are all about partnerships. And if any of this information resonates with you and you'd like to find a way for us to work together and we can enhance your work in any way, please don't hesitate to contact us. We have um, university networks, educators networks, uh, we're uh, building a lot of different ways, entry points into this topic of biomimicry and, and love nothing more than strategic partnerships. My last thought for you is as we look to biomimicry and everything that I've told you, we're facing a vast frontier for well-adapted innovation. 
I think we, humans as a young species, we're just now at the forefront of having the knowledge and the wherewithal as we move from kind of uh, our uh, stone age and, and prehistory society into a high technology <coughs> society. Figuring out the high tech part of well adopted innovation is, is wide open. There's a lot of opportunity for learning. There's a lot of opportunity for investment. There's a lot of opportunity for us as a society to mature and become a, a more well-adapted species. And along those lines, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein that reinforces how big that frontier is. And he says, we still do not know one one-thousandth of one percent of what nature has revealed to us. So we're just getting started. Biomimicry can be a great platform. And I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak to you today, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and for Bradford University, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you.